Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Grassman. In the South, they call it Skunk Ape, Wood Booger, or Rougarou. And across the globe, Yeti, Yowie, and Yaren, to name a few. More than 30 Native American tribes have a name for the beast. Some as endearing as Big Brother, or as ominous as Boss of the Mountain. They've been depicted on the walls of caves for centuries. To date, there are over 11,000 reported sightings of these creatures in North America alone. There is an abundance of physical, empirical, and anecdotal evidence supporting the existence of these seemingly human primates, yet it is still considered a myth. Our focus is not to research or try to prove Bigfoot exists, but to document the findings and experiences of Bigfoot researchers and everyday people like ourselves. Joined by my wife and co-host Linda and field producer Scott Owens, we will travel the country interviewing, taking expedition, and visiting the locations where their Bigfoot odyssey began, bringing to you their means, observations, and interactions with the man-like beast known as Bigfoot. I'm Kerry Arnold, and this is Bigfoot Odyssey. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in rustic southeast Oklahoma. We're with Bill and Sheila Tucker. As one half of the Squatch team on YouTube, this couple's Bigfoot Odyssey began about 10 years ago when they captured an apparent juvenile Sasquatch on a game camera. Well, since then, they've traveled the country researching for themselves and investigating for the BFRO, but now spend most of their time continuing the research of Mr. Robert Dodson, who passed away in June of 2018. Now, with more than 10 years under their belt, we're only bringing you a small portion of their Bigfoot odyssey. For the rest, you have to go check out the more than 80 videos of information they have on YouTube. Hope y'all enjoy the show. Bill and Sheila, we really are happy to be here. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down with us, go through your your story, your experiences, and what you've learned about these things. And you now we came. Uh, it was a little bit hard to find. <laughs> and this is uh, this is your cabin, right? This is not where you guys live. This is just like your uh, getaway. Our work in progress. Yeah, I wish we had a getaway like this. Yeah, I love uh, this. this well, we, we base all of our research out of out of here, and then we spread out uh, throughout southeastern Oklahoma to do our research. But uh, we we base it out of this cabin here. Okay. Now, you guys have been doing this for, for a little while now. What, about 10 years? Yeah, something like that. Before that, tell us... How did, how did you feel about Bigfoot? Was it ever even a thought? Well, 10 years ago, uh, Bigfoot wasn't even a thought. It wasn't even a consideration. We didn't, we didn't even know uh, anything about a Bigfoot. And I guess where this really started with us was probably 2002, 2003, somewhere in that time frame, uh, I had uh, some property leased down in Callahan County, which is would be southeast of Abilene, Texas. It was just just us there. It was summer and we had the windows open. Yeah, and we were doing some work on the property, and um, gosh, about two o'clock in the morning. Sheila wakes me up, and she, her very words were, do you smell that? So it took me a few minutes to wake up, but when I did get awake and conscious enough to know what she was talking about, the entire trailer was permeated with this awful, terrible smell. You know, it almost make you sick at your stomach. Well, we laid there for a second and talked about it. And I then, remember saying, go see what that is. And you said, I'm not going out there. <laughs> yeah, especially after a few minutes, we heard heavy footfalls right outside the window. Right. Well, when you smell that, you know it's not something normal. Right. No. 
because we've pig hunted you know we're hunters pigs can stink like crazy and if it's pigs they don't there's not one of them there's a herd of them and they're noisy it was not a pig you heard, heard bipedal pigs. footsteps we heard heavy bipedal footsteps outside the trailer it sounded like it was right outside the window where we were or we were positioned but um we heard that for a few minutes and then it went it got quiet outside and then the smell started dissipating. We didn't smell it anymore. So next morning, uh, I did get up and go outside and uh, there were some footprints out there. And I'm thinking, you know, who's out here in the middle of the night walking around barefooted and that kind of thing. So that was kind of our first experience with, uh, this entity we call Bigfoot, and a number of years went by after that, and we didn't even think about it anymore. But that's really the first time that I feel like, or we feel like, that we came in contact uh, with something that was unknown. We didn't know what it was. We had no idea other than we knew it smelled really bad. Right. Now, fast forward just a few years, and you guys had an event that actually got you looking for these things right yes uh we a number of years went by i don't know exactly how long but we had another piece of property uh, that was leased uh up near coleman texas a little town called valera it's pretty close to callahan county but we uh, we had our travel trailer down there and and we would go down on the weekends and and uh, stay down there and work on the property and get ready for deer season and that kind of thing. Uh, we had some strange things go on down there. We had, uh, like in the middle of the night, uh, we would have rocks hit the trailer. And this happened on numerous occasions. Just sounded like somebody was standing out there throwing rocks and hitting the trailer. Well, I had uh, had set up some game cameras uh, to monitor what deer was coming into the feeders and that kind of thing. And I had went down one morning and pulled the SD cards and went back to the camper and stuck the SD cards in. And I was going through them and, uh, you know, saying, oh, that's a big doe or that's a nice buck, that kind of thing, looking at the deer. I popped up one frame and I just, I'm sure my eyes got big as saucers mm -hmm. because, and I called Sheila in there and I said, you gotta see this. Tell me what this is. This is the image of what appears to be a juvenile or a young adult Sasquatch. Uh, you can see it's sitting there on its butt, legs out, reaching out for that corn. I think coming across this, not expecting it, would probably surprise anyone. If you look close enough, you can see it's a, got a monkey looking face on this creature. It's an excellent image. I had coated that corn inside the feeder with a product called Corn Coat. It's very sweet. And uh, it was just amazing what we'd got on that particular frame. It appeared to be a, a juvenile Bigfoot that was sitting there picking up that corn. Later that day, we had went we went down and was looking around that area, looking for footprints or any other evidence that we could find of what exactly this was. Well, I noticed there's a huge oak tree where the camera was positioned, and I looked up, and about eight foot up in a limb, there was this big wad of hair that was entangled in the in some brush in that limb. Now, this is the hair they collected, and it's hard to say, but it just doesn't look like it's from any kind of known animal that I've ever heard of. It's very interesting. So, I'm thinking, you know, is this something that maybe came off of one of these creatures or but we went back to the, the trailer and I got some, some tweezers and some rubber gloves and I collected that hair. It's very coarse, it's pretty long, it's probably six or seven inches long. It was about eight foot up, pretty much right where that creature was sitting. Yeah. Straight up in the tree. And we don't think he was that tall, 
because we measured some grass that was around him and just guesstimating if he would have stood up. That's why we think the juvenile, maybe five and a half, six foot tall, which leads me to wonder if there was an adult there with him because he was only in one frame. And right. did the adults say, hey, Junior, get over here? So I, I don't think it was the juveniles here. I, he wasn't tall enough to reach that, but yeah. it's strange he was only in one frame. So I don't know. Well, I probably didn't realize there was a camera there until the until took the picture. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then that was it. There, to me, there's no doubt what it is. It's not a hog. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a hog. It's yeah. not a. That's it's not a, a deer. Hand reaching out there, you can see his legs. He's. Uh, well, we, what gets me about it is he's reaching to it. Like maybe. Maybe he knew there's a camera there. Maybe it's like on the edge of the hour light or something and reaching in instead of just sitting right there picking it up. Like he's back a little bit reaching into it. So I wonder if maybe they didn't notice that light anyway and we're just hoping the camera didn't go off or something. I don't know. Maybe so, you know, maybe juveniles aren't that smart. Yeah, maybe. You know, if mom was close by or dad was close by, uh, they you know, would have said, hey, you need to get out of here. And maybe in leaving, they got the hair off their head caught in that limb as they were right. leaving. But this sparked. Well, this sparked a lot of interest. And there's a little, another little part of this story. Uh, in that, that same area, a couple of weeks later, well, actually, it was a little longer than that because it was cold weather. We were down there. and. Every time we were down at camp and we'd get ready to go, well, I'd go down and throw scraps out, or, you know, for the raccoons or whatever. And Sheila said, hey, why don't you place uh, some, we had a couple of donuts left, and she said, why don't you place uh, some donuts down there where you throw the scraps out and see what happens. Well, I did. I placed three donuts on a log there. And we came back the next weekend, and lo and behold, the donuts are gone, and there are three rocks on top of that log. Pretty safe to assume that raccoons are not doing that. I don't think so. I don't think raccoons are replacing the donuts with rocks. <laughs> uh, that day, we got to looking around, and, and there's a little bit of a swampy area over there, and we found a 17-inch footprint. This is an image of the footprint they found that day. It's a little bit weathered, but there's a well-defined heel. You can see what looks like a mid-tarsal joint there. And for comparison, I believe Bill wears a size 10 or 11. It's a, definitely a large foot. Those events that occurred over that late summer, early fall, really piqued our interest in, in this entity known as Bigfoot. So we started doing research and started researching, trying to gain as much information as we could. We felt well, like... Back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. On that same lease, because of those events, and we were really getting interested and starting to watch the videos and thinking, what, what have we got going here? We had several other things that made us scratch our head, the fun in the skull in the, in the tree. And then we paid attention to the rocks that were being thrown and the strange noises that weren't any animal noises. That right. Now we started paying attention to those. And as we watched the videos, we learned other people were sharing the same type of experiences. So it just kind of validated that we were on to something here. And, and so that kind of piqued our interest to really start getting more involved and see exactly what was going on here. We were walking and we had structures there that would walk by before, mm -hmm. but now we looked at them right. and we were like, that couldn't have just happened. And we were walking back to our stand and we looked up and there was a skull in the tree, like eight foot high up well, in the it, tree. It wasn't a skull, it was a large leg bone yeah. of a deer or, or I think it was a deer, there was a large, uh, maybe a leg bone up in a tree just wedged in between some limbs and you know how did it get there how, it was uh, things that we didn't pay attention to before that now made us go hmm and once there 
I shot a huge buck and I knew it was a good shot. I saw the shot, saw him go down, got up, ran a little bit, went down again and he was down. I knew he was down. And I called Bill on the radio and I said, you need to come over here. And he said, okay, well sit tight. Just let it lay for a minute and I'll be there. It took him about 15, 20 minutes and I got down on the stand. We went to where I shot it and it was a good lung shot. There was a big, you know, blood lung shot. Then we followed the path a little bit more where I told him I saw it fall. That deer was gone. We never found that deer. And we searched for two and a half, three hours. And we always scratched our head and went, where could it go? It, it was a dead deer. Yeah. yeah, had the same thing happen to me, exact same thing. But you know, what appears to be a similar dynamic is all these things going on around you. Mm -hmm. And you either explain it away, something else. There's just, and there's no reason to think that it's anything else until you do. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, it doesn't matter who we talk to that. It's, a, it's awareness. Yeah. You're not aware. But once you are aware, you start picking up mm -hmm. on all these other things. Exactly. Now, you have, this is, this is your research cabin here, and you guys have a gifting area here. Is that we right? Do. We do. We have a gifting area here. When we first bought this property, we, we thought, well, let's set up a gifting area and just to kind of see what might happen. Bill and Sheila took us out to the gifting area. You know, we didn't have any real activity, but what I did notice is there is a ton of deer around this place. Now, coming into the actual gifting area, the first thing I noticed was this bear on the ground and all these toys hanging up in the tree. But Bill said that they don't mess with those toys very much at all. This is some glyphs that just showed up there one day. I think Sheila made one, one of those, but it got moved. Uh, they're pointing in the direction of the cabin, whatever that means, who knows. But you see this, these toys and rocks lined up here. The blue rock is the rock that they found on the steps of the camper when they showed up the day before. And then that rag laying there was wrapped around the little Bigfoot doll. This whistle, she said, was perfectly intact. And now you can see it looks like it's been either bitten on or chewed and it's all cracked up, but it was placed back on the log. So again, whatever all those things mean, who knows? And they have found the little Sasquatch doll shoved up in that cedar tree a few times. But every time we would come up the first two or three weeks, nothing was moved, nothing was touched. Then we come up one weekend, I guess we've been on, on the property about a month, maybe. We come up one weekend, we go down to the gifting area and there's some stuff that's strange down there. The, we had a little stuffed baby Bigfoot doll that Sheila had placed on a log down there. Well, it, it was gone. I wrapped it in a little blanket. Yeah. And put it on a log. Hey, it's a mama thing. <laughs> but I got to looking for it and I found it stuffed up in a tree. And uh, glyphs and... Well, but wait, the blanket showed up we have our travel trailer parked here on the property. Mm -hmm. The little blanket that was wrapped around Bigfoot showed up on the steps to the trailer. And it was the blanket that I'd wrapped the little baby Bigfoot in. And you've had other things show up on those steps, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a, a, Sheila had left a real, a blue, she found this real pretty blue rock that we had left down there. They seemed to like the color blue for some reason. But we had left it down there and, and we came up and the blue rock showed up on the doorstep of the the travel trailer also. And nobody comes out here. No, this no, no. This is, this is so uh, You yeah, can't get through here. our gate to get here. Yeah, it's so. a locked gate. And we had trouble finding it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's hard to find. And we had a teddy bear that was propped up against the tree, and it was positioned on its head. It was turned upside down. On its head. And they left a glyph. Somebody left a glyph. Oh, you know, a, a Y stick with a stick. I think we put a picture of that on it. In it. Is it usually always that same well, Y stick? No, because I put one down there. There was one, a Y stick, and it had two sticks on this side of it and a stick going in it. So I put one right beside it, and I put 
the same thing, but I put the two sticks on this side. Mm. When we went back down there this time, my glyph is moved over by their glyph, and the two sticks are back here again. Mm. So, they're and, correcting you. And I if guess. you look That's at it, it, it can't, it's, it's a little, you know, not a very strong little twig, so it couldn't have just planted itself. It had to be pushed sure. into the ground. And nobody, nobody has access to this property back here. You would have to park and walk a long ways back in there sure. through the woods, and and you know nobody's nobody's going to do that. And we found uh, uh, two skulls up in a tree down here actually on two different locations i found another skull up in a tree in one location and then another location across the property i found two skulls i took us out to where the skulls are in the trees and just 15 feet away is this vertebrae uh bill says it's a black bear and i think he's probably right it's it's way too big to be a deer i know that for sure but just 15 feet away in this cedar tree here are these two skulls now, the one on the left is deer. It's definitely a deer. I've seen it a thousand times. The one on the right, we think, is a black bear. Uh, not really know a whole lot about black bear, but what kills a black bear and then puts its skull in a tree? If you look over here behind the tree, that was placed there. Now. That big tree is a pine, but everything else is hardwood. And there is no hardwood anywhere around there for at least 100 feet. So there's nowhere for that stuff to have fallen from. Uh, came around to the back side of it here, and you can see it looks like a little cleared area where something has been sitting and hiding. I just wonder if this, the skulls in the tree and this apparent little blind area here isn't some kind of marker for a good hunting area, there is a really well-used game trail that goes right beside this. And you can see that's, that's all hardwood and that has got to be from somewhere else brought in there. Coming back around to the other side and you see these hardwood limbs that they're broken off and had to be brought in there either by someone or a Sasquatch. That's the only two explanations for it. Now, aside from the fact that you guys have seen these things multiple occasions, right? Yes. Well, won't you talk about some of the times that you've actually had visual encounters? Well, let's back up a little bit and tell you how we got to know Robert, Robert Dodson. Okay, yeah. Because that's kind of where we- I think most of our we... viewers are gonna know who Robert Dodson is. Yeah, and Robert's, uh, research area is now our research area okay. and along with Udell and and uh, some other folks but so after all that happened at the deer lease the last deer lease and we knew we were on to something we started watching more videos and in one of their shows they said you can be part of this expedition and you know you went online and uh, you could actually go with, with a group of people and go on Bigfoot expeditions so we did, and we, the first one we went to was in Kentucky. Kentucky. And what I think really got us interested was the kind of people you meet are amazing. They're, number one, you instantly like each other because you share a common bond. But I mean, they're from all walks of life. And you know, we have met people from all over the U.S. that we're still friends with mm -hmm. because of these events. And, uh, you know, we share like stories. Everybody has a story. That's why they're there. Through that, we learned, um, well, one of the leaders, uh, Jack Smart, talked to us about being a researcher. So, investigator. Investigator. So we came back from the Kentucky and applied, went through the process to become an investigator for BFRO. And so then we kept going to these BFRO expeditions because they're a heck of a lot of fun, but you just meet the greatest people. Mm -hmm. And we had some really great experiences. And so we were continuing to get more and more interested in it. So we started, we ran across Robert's videos. And if y'all have not seen Robert Dodson's videos, you, he, the man's 
just so much fun to watch. He, okay. he is fearless. When I saw, we started watching his videos and I told Sheila, I said, we got to meet this guy. I mean, it, you, you talk about out of the box thinking, the way he approached his research, it, it was just off the wall. And he was getting some good results. So I told Sheila, we got, we got to try to meet this guy. So he announced on his channel that he was having a, a camp out and he was only going to take a few people. So I contacted him and he accepted us to go. So we went down and it started raining uh, that Saturday morning and basically it rained the whole weekend. Well, it rained, that rained us out. So we came back home and I got uh, a message from Robert a couple of days later, said, hey, I hate you guys got rained out. Why don't you and Sheila come back? So we did. We went back the next weekend and spent uh, a weekend with Robert and Udell Head, who is Robert's research partner. And through that, we built a relationship and really built a friendship with Robert and for whatever reason, Robert kind of took us under his wing and mentored us and we talked a lot about research techniques and the two things Robert really talked about was honesty, being honest about what you're doing. That was the main thing that, that he really pushed with you've got to be honest about what you're doing. And we built a, a relationship with Robert that went on over time and uh, we would go down every couple of weeks and spend three or four days with Robert and Udell down on his research area. And uh, the two sightings that we've had have been down at Robert's research area. Robert, as y'all probably know, Robert lived with these creatures. Yeah. He moved to southeast Oklahoma set up his travel trailer. He lived in his research area 24 seven. He lived with them. He had them named. Uh, he, he knew basically where they're gonna be, where they stayed, what they did, where they moved. And he talked to them all the time. Wherever he was at, out in the woods, he was talking to them, calling them by name and calling them names that you can't repeat on the air. We won't repeat on the air, but. <laughs> Yeah, but he, he had, was quite a character. He had Big Red, he had Blondie. Shadow. He had Shadow, which was a little juvenile Bigfoot. Now, this is the Robert Dodson image I'm sure most of you have seen already of uh, the juvenile he called Shadow. And you can see it sitting there with its hand kind of covering its face a little bit. I mean, there's no doubt what that is. And there are some pretty good breakdowns of it. I think Tridiver did a good breakdown of it and uh, maybe a few others tackled it, but it's a great image. Yeah, there's no doubt what that there's is. no doubt what that is, absolutely no yeah, doubt. That was just like, what's 10 feet away? It was 10 feet away from him. Never yeah. knew it was there. He didn't even know it was there when he was filming, and uh, uh, later in reviewing the film, there it is, just 10 foot away from him with its hand like this trying to hide from him. and. I think he surprised it and caught it there, and it was too late for it to get away, so it just froze. Right. And he got it on video. But he had these creatures named. Uh, there was Creepfoot and the Eleven Footer, and he, he had them all named. And we've had two visual sightings down there. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the first one. Uh, we were down at what Robert called a swamp. It's a tall ridge that, that slides down into a swampy area, and Robert knew that they stayed in that particular area, so I don't know what time it was. It was probably right at dusky dark. We, our intention was to have a night excursion. We got down there, and I told the group, it was me and Sheila and Udell Head, and I told them I'm gonna make a wood knock just to announce our presence, and try to get them maybe to come in. So I did a wood knock. 10 seconds later, about 200 yards down the ridge, we hear this God awful scream. It sounded like somebody was murdering a lady. And I told the group, I said, well, he's too lazy to find a stick. He's just gonna scream at us to let us know he's here. 
we start noticing uh, movement in the brush down the ridge from us. So I start filming in that area there, concentrating in that area there. Well, Sheila was uh, below me with a pair of binoculars and more or less kind of looking halfway down the ridge. And you want to talk about what you saw? Well, it took me by such surprise I couldn't believe I was seeing it. I mean, it was what we call Big Red and it came up between two trees. I can't, I don't know the distance. It, you know, we were not close enough to, for me to tell you how far apart those trees were, but I know his shoulders were filling the air between those two trees. And he was looking, when I swung my binoculars, we were eye to eye. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, you just it just takes you by such surprise because you're looking so hard, you want to see them, and then when you do, you're like, oh, wow. And how far away from you? Uh, I'm going to say he was probably 60, 70 yards. Now, I believe this is the clearest image they had where you can actually make out that there is something there. You can see a body. It actually looks kind of reddish colored. Like I said, not that clear, but that just speaks to how hard these creatures are to film. She just happened to catch him moving between those two trees, and as she watched him, he would squat down. I think he realized I had honed in on him, and he stopped his movement, and then he started the rocking that we've heard other people witness, mm -hmm. and then he would go down uh, almost to the ground and then come back up. And that was the part that was so um, awesome because when you would go down and you would see him slowly come up and I would think, my goodness, how much more room can he have to stand up? Because it was just... He just kept going. Huh? Yeah, just so massive. And then he would start the rocking. And I guess I watched him for, what, a minute and a half? Well, she wouldn't give us the binoculars. <laughs> my heart was just... <laughs> give me the binoculars, give me the binoculars. <laughs> You try to focus a camera down there, and it is so thick in that area, uh, especially if you have a camera that doesn't have manual focus on it. Right. Uh, you know, it's trying to focus on the closest thing to you, but uh, it was probably a minute, minute and a half before he decided that he was going to leave and, and get out of that area. Now, all this time, we're still catching movement down the ridge, so I know there were more than one. Uh, the one that, that we were seeing down the ridge through the binoculars, and then there was another one up on the ridge that we, we kept catching movement. Uh, just a, a glimpse of something going between two trees really quick. So we were catching movement down there. So there, I know there were more than one. There had to be two there. But even when you're looking at it, you try to tell yourself, it can't be, <laughs> it just can't be. But, you know, when you can see it so clearly, it, it was. It's, I think it's hard to really, um, once you see one, to really say, wow, this is it. This is really happening. Right. I guess, so I guess even looking for them, because a lot of people that look for them have never seen them. Mm -hmm. They see the evidence, and they collect really good evidence. Or they might get a glimpse. It's, it's like a transition from believing or being convinced mm -hmm. to knowing yeah when you know it just and you know we had seen a lot everything. of evidence we'd seen footprints we would you know collected the hair we'd captured them on video but when you actually are standing there looking at it it's you just almost try to talk yourself out of it but then you're like this is really happening mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah it was a pretty awesome second visual sighting that we had there were four of us it was me and sheila robert dotson and udell head were down there we were actually was actually down in the swamp again we were down at the bottom of the ridge we had parked the four wheelers down there and we had walked all out in the swamp and trying to see what we could find and we got back to the four wheelers and we were fixing to leave and we were talking about what we wanted to do uh, that afternoon. Well, suddenly Udell said, you guys see what I see up on the ridge? So we all look up there 
and it's probably 200 foot to the top of that ridge. But when you get to the top of the ridge, you can see the skyline up there. And standing there <clears throat> was probably a seven, seven and a half foot cone head something standing there watching us. Mm -hmm. And it went down when we all started looking at it. It, it did. went down. It went down. All you like could see then position. was the head and the cone head and part of the shoulders. Everybody was grasping, trying to get the cameras and trying to get the cameras focused up there. So I told the guys and, and Sheila, I said, you guys stay here, get the camera on it. I'm going to go around and see if I can flank it and come around the other way and at least we'll get some movement. So I did. I went around and came back up on the ridge and came trying to get around behind it and I got about 70 yards from where it was uh, where it was standing and then all of a sudden I hear this gosh awful crashing through the brush as it as it took off running. But what you Dell and I saw from the bottom of the ridge watching him go up was it seemed to not take its focus off of you Dell and I. And when Bill started to go up the ridge you would see a slight movement of his head. I mean you had to be watching through binoculars but it was very slight. So it was like it was watching us, but keeping an eye on Bill. Mm -hmm. And when Bill got to however many feet you said, it did a full turn and then it was gone. And we saw it. It, it turned gone. its head and in one smooth movement, he was gone. Gone the other way. Yeah. You are not yeah. flanking anybody. No, no, he knew, I, <laughs> he he knew what was going on. Uh, my deal was how how close is he going to let me get to him? Right. I had a camera with me, and just how close is he going to let me get? Am I going to get close enough to get this on video before he takes off? Man, when he took off, it was it was tearing brush big time. It was it was leaving the area quickly. When you talk about movement, and that's a rare thing for anybody to get. You know, you see a lot of video, a lot of pictures of quote unquote Sasquatch, you know, it's a lot of times you just can't tell what it is. But you've got a video, with, there's three in it. Now this is the video I'm talking about and you can see there's one little face down there at the bottom and one there's one right there in the middle and that one up top you can see him, it's on a loop. But he leans out there and to me that's very rare. To catch one of these, two of these or three of these together and to see any movement at all. But if you look at the one in the middle at his hand on the back side of that tree, you can see his fingers moving there, or her fingers. And as it leans out a little bit, I think this is just incredible. That was a, a special video. Uh, when Robert passed away, before he passed away, he had asked us to continue his research down in his research area, which I was honored. I felt like that was a huge honor for us to to be able to take take to over his work. Back up just a little bit, so that people that don't know Robert know, Robert was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and in about three four months he was gone. So we stayed in touch with him. We visited him many times in the hospital, and so he it wasn't like he just said, "When I'm gone, I want y'all to do this." Yeah. It was a thought out plan. Right. He knew he was dying, and so he. Like but that. he yeah, he just passed was it October? Oh, passed that's... away in uh it was July. July the twenty seventh, I believe. Um he was diagnosed in June. I mean he only lived It wasn't that fast. I don't remember the exact date. So he lived about three, four months. Three months. But we already knew something wasn't right with Robert. We noticed a difference and in fact we were the one that kind of brought it to attention of Udell and his family that something was not right with Robert and that led to him being diagnosed so but one of the visits to him in the hospital I guess it's the last time we visited him he said I'd like for you and Sheila to continue my work with along with you Dale and so uh, it just I was honored to do that and sure. which I told him so and uh, so now the squash team was three 
And we met this guy from Florida, he lives in Tampa, Florida. He flies in once a month and uh, spends a few days with us doing research, but he's, uh, he's an expert on editing film okay. with stabilizations and all the thing he does. So really, uh, he's a, a huge asset to the Squatch team. So Scott Hunley. His name is Scott Hunley. Yeah, it would have been nice to get those guys too. Yeah, they're actually over in another area in Oklahoma doing research this weekend. And well, y'all weren't y'all going up there? Yeah, we were supposed to be there, but we had an opportunity. up there. Well, we had an opportunity to visit with you guys, and plus the, the weather's been horrible. Oh yes, yeah. hence and the caps on our heads. Yeah, <laughs> it is raining. It's been raining for two or three days, and the weather's just been horrible. And last time I talked to Scott. Uh, they were going to don their their rain suits and get out there, and it's not not good for cameras, as you well know. No. But anyway, the Squatch team now grew grew to four people in, instead of just the two. But it was it was an honor for us to be able to uh, continue Robert's uh, research down in his research area, and the gentleman that owns the property. Um, is a good friend of ours also that actually owns that property. Right. He also asked us uh, to be sure and honor Robert's wishes and take this property and it's your research area. Do what you need to do. So well, That's great. Uh, but aside from that area and here, you guys travel all over pretty much, right? Just we do. We've, uh, we've been on expeditions to of course, Kentucky, we've been on expeditions to Missouri, Louisiana, uh, New Mexico, Colorado. We, uh, before we bought this property, we decided that that's what we're going to do. I'm going to do research on a computer and we'll find out where the hotspots are and we're going to go there and stay 10 days, two weeks doing research in, in these areas. And uh, we have seen a lot. Okay, now y'all talk about the more fearful experiences you've had what are what are some of the more intimidating or more most afraid i guess that you've been since you've been doing this i think the scariest one for me was when we were just bill and i at kettle lake and we don't ever stay on trail we go way back into the forest he marks a gps wayside and we just take off and it was at night it's probably not a good plan but we have done that a time too Except the one time you ever got to mark the GPS and we wandered around for a while, but that's another show. So we were way back in the woods and um, we heard, we heard, we'd been hearing something, we knew they were in the area, and all of a sudden we heard a loud guttural growl. It was not a bear, it was not a pig, it was one of those, if you've heard it, you know it. And then a huge tree broke. You could tell it was huge by the crackling and the way it sounded. And it was close, it was very close. It was just Bill and I off a trail. I don't even know if we were armed that night. We probably were. But Bill started talking calmly to it and saying stuff like, okay, it's your place, not ours. We're getting out of here. So we packed it up and got it out because you know, we feel strongly that, and our t-shirts, that our Squatch team t-shirts say respect the Squatch. Mm -hmm. And when they're acting that way, you get out of there. That's not something you want to hang around for. Right. And you, that you can feel the energy and you know, get out of there. So he kept talking and quietly and calmly and we got out of there as quickly as we could. I felt like we were in danger that night. Well, we went back down there <clears throat> the next morning when it got daylight and we went back down in that area and it was a tree about 10 inches in diameter that was broke off about three foot high, just snapped, pushed over. And like she said, I basically just started telling it, okay, we understand you don't want us here and we're going to we're gonna leave. We made our way back to the main trail and uh, we started hearing whoops back down in that area and then on the other side of the trail also we started hearing 
whoops. And my assumption was they're telling each other they're leaving. They're they're getting out of here. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Caddo, but that's in the where Arkansas and Louisiana and Texas all kind of come together there in that corner. Not too awfully far as the crow flies from Fra uh, Falk, Arkansas, mm -hmm. and everybody knows what Falk's famous oh, yeah. for. So we weren't too awfully far from from that particular area, but that was one. Uh, instance where I felt and Sheila felt it, uh, a little bit intimidated. I knew they didn't want us there and I wasn't going to wait around and find out what they might do if we didn't leave. Sure. The other situation, the one that I can remember offhand that was a little intimidating was uh, we were up in Robert's research area. This was after Robert had passed away. Uh, it was a moonlit night that night, and we were following a creek, and it was light enough you could see to walk without a flashlight. And as we were, we had been down in that area for probably two or three hours, and we decided, all right, we're going to go back to camp and get some and rest. Seen some night, some eye shine earlier in the evening. Yeah, and as we're walking along, following that creek, all of a sudden. From behind us, a huge rock, a little bit bigger than a softball, come flying over my head, landed about 10 feet from me, rolled down the hill and into the creek. Well, of course, when that happened, we all spun around and I hit the button on my, my light. And when I did, we had eye shine about 40 yards behind us, two white, eyes about six and a half seven foot tall behind us well uh, we decided that probably the best thing we needed to do was get on out of there and and uh, as i thought probably they were telling us y'all need to leave right. and as we're going out you could hear very plainly behind us as we walked out bipedal footsteps behind us but there was also footsteps to the left of us. So we felt like we had one behind us and then one parallel in us escorting us out. And when we got within two or 300 yards of camp, it stopped. It was almost like, okay, we've escorted you back to your camp. You know, we know you're out of our area, so we're all good. That was uh, a little bit intimidating that night. They could have very easily hit me or hit one of us Mm -hmm. with that rock, I think, if they would have wanted to. But I think they were just telling us, you guys need to leave the area. Y'all have been here long enough. And we basically did what they said. It's time to go. But that's two instances that I can think of that, that were pretty harrowing. Now, I don't feel like they've ever really been aggressive enough that we felt like they were going to hurt us or felt like that they were uh, uh, going to do us harm. Now we've had them on multiple occasions with rocks and, and big sticks and things thrown at us that I think they're telling us that you've been here long enough or you've come far enough and you need to get out of here. But as far as feeling like that we were in harm's way and it's imminent that we're going to get hurt, I've never really felt that. But we've always uh, heeded what they want us to do. Right. If they're wanting us to leave, then it's time to leave. Now there's a place down there in Robert's location that you were talking about. When you cross the creek, it gets hairy. So you think that might be either a birthing area or a place they keep the youngins. I think like you were telling me, whenever you cross that creek, it gets it pretty, gets hairy, pretty, pretty you know, hairy. We've always felt that in talking amongst ourselves, and we've been there multiple, multiple times and had this happen on, on many occasions. There's a, there's a creek down there. Um, it's down in what we call 11 footer area and 
when you cross that creek and go to the other side, uh, you're going to start getting growled at. You're going to start getting rocks thrown. Uh, they don't want you over there. And we've always felt like that that's either uh, where the little ones stay during the day with what we call day watchers, or it's a birthing area like, like you talked about. But multiple occasions we've been run out of there. Excuse me, Udell actually got physically chased out of there, uh, got growled at, got rocks thrown at him, uh, had a bluff charge take place where something comes tearing through the brush at you and then stops. So, uh, and, and we've had that also. When you cross that creek over there in that one particular area, they're gonna escort you out of there. And it just, to me, makes sense that it's either a birthing area or it's where the little ones stay during the day yeah. with the day watchers. So. And it's not like just an easy creek to cross. <laughs> There's rapid water, it's a wide creek, so it would make sense that they would set up on that side of the creek with things right. that they want to protect. It's It takes some skill to get across that creek. In fact, Scott lost a bunch of his equipment going <laughs> down the creek. He, he recovered it, but you don't, it's not easy to get there. And that would well, be- Would have been nice to be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To film. Yeah. And that's not four or 500 yards from where we got the, the three Sasquatch on video, the one that was peeking out from behind the tree. That's not far from that area. And the reason we call it 11 and a half, 11 footer area, because that's where Robert filmed one and we went back later and was able to measure based on where it was standing in the tree that it was standing by, that it was at least 11 foot tall. And as soon as y'all cross back over from the creek, the activity stops. It stops. It settles down. It stops and are we hear them. We know they're there, like just making sure that just we don't there. come back. But they'll whistle. We'll hear them whistle um, or see quick movement. So they, they follow you. Yeah, they don't want you there for some reason. Yeah. They don't want you in that area. Get a little bit too close. Too close to something over there. <clears throat> yeah. Now, as far as what what you guys do here, you do some research here. What uh, experiences have y'all had in this area here? Well, outside of uh, uh, the gifting area that that we talked about earlier, we've got a video on on the channel, uh, the Squatch Team channel, that uh, on one of our game cameras we caught some eye shine. We went out to the area, that's the tree that the game camera was on, facing back this way, where he caught the eye shine. There's three deer standing under that feeder in the picture. And right back there behind Linda, you can see where there's some briar, and it's going over a limb. And we're gonna get a perspective. Sheila's standing over there. I think she's five, four, five, five, something like that. And you can see where those briars come over that limb coming across there in the images that's where you're going to want to watch now this is one of the pictures without the eye shine and it's on the left side in that dark area there just over those briars is where you're going to see the eye shine now this is the first picture with the eye shine and we don't know how far back there that is but to the top of that briar coming over that limb there is about seven and a half or eight feet this is the second image where the, you see the eyes moved up just a little bit, very, very far apart. And they just, they don't look like forward facing eyes. Now, I don't know what that means, but that is about nine and a half, ten 10 feet. But this one, he ducked down, he's just over, I think the deer are looking at him, just over those briars. And if you look close, you can almost see the shape of the head. Pretty scary. And we found footprints there in that area, and you could tell that the ground was had been chomped on by something heavy. But not too far from there in that same area is where we found the skull tree. And the footprint. 
and the footprints and uh, <clears throat> there, there are several structures around the property uh, that it there's just no reason for it to be there. Now this is one of the blinds, one of the more obvious blinds. If you look through there you can probably find 10 or 12 more like this but this one's pretty obvious. Um, that's not anything broken off the tree that it's by. If you look, you can look through the woods pretty good. So you can kind of imagine how this would be an advantage for something or someone that was all one solid color. They can get right up in there and, and just look like a shadow. But all that stuff is broken off. There's no cut marks on any of it. And you can, you could see when we looked where someone, something was sitting up in there. And I don't imagine that it was for any kind of shelter. Uh, if you got in there from the rain, it wouldn't keep you very dry. But it's, it's a very interesting find for sure, that for that stuff to be drug up and piled up there for whatever reason. It just wasn't done naturally. But like I said, you could walk that entire property and probably find 10 or 12 what appears to be blinds or something that was brought in for somewhere else. This one was just one of the more obvious ones. You can tell something had to put it there. There's just no reason for it to be there. Then I had the rock thrown at me when I was hunting in a pop-up. I was sitting in this blind, watching the feeder there, and my foot was up against the canvas on the inside of the blind. And I heard, you know how you heard, and then you, it's like, you know, you kind of feel something before it happens. I heard it, something coming, and it hit right up against that, and it hit my foot. I mean, my foot was in the canvas, but it was bam, hard. So it wasn't like a cone that fell from the tree or something. It was a rock, and we found it out here later. And as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> here I am by myself. So I picked up the radio, and I said, yeah, I think I'd like you to escort me back to the cabin. And He's, where do you think the rock came from? That way. Back here? Yeah, you could just feel the way it hit my foot, that it was coming from back there. Look at all the trees. You couldn't just. Right. And you were facing this way. Like they knew you were facing that way, so they came up behind you and just mm -hmm. threw a rock at you. Yeah. Crazy. So he came and walked me back. I would not get out. I chambered a, a round. That was about and dark. And I would not get out till he it got was here. Right at dark. Yeah. So. Well, we've had strange things to happen around the cabin. Uh, rocks hit the cabin during the night and wake you up and uh, just different strange things like that that, that go on around here. Uh, I personally don't believe there's a clan that lives here. I think they travel through this area. Uh, there's a lot of wooded area here. But I just really hadn't found any evidence that there's a clan that lives here. But I definitely believe they pass through this area. We've got a lot of hogs and a tremendous amount of deer. There's a lot of food for them. And water. And water. But it's the evidence that we found is just an indication that they travel through here from time to time. Right. And they would choose an area like this because these animals, they watch. They're so aware. And they know we're not here all the time. And so they could move easily through here without being detected. And they know when we're here. Uh, they know when our truck's out there and they know when there's movement. Well, I know, we stayed in the camper last night. And it was about two o'clock, I woke up. And it sounded like rocks clacking. And I hear people uh, say that it's them clacking their teeth how anybody would know that without seeing it I don't know but and if you're seeing it and not filming it shame on you shame on you exactly. <laughs> for the rest of us to see but it's what it sounded like and it probably happened five or six times 
and then I didn't hear it anymore. But it was pretty loud, and it was back in that direction. I don't know what direction that is. Well, that would be west. West, okay. Yeah. And we have heard, or you know, noises. We have our camper parked here on the property, which is what you're referring to. Uh, yeah, our travel trailer and we have heard what we felt like was someone hitting the trailer and that trailer is where they returned the little bigfoot blanket and the blue rock right on the step yeah in that camper in that trailer that you're staying in so for some reason they think we're in that trailer <laughs> well it's, it's just right up against the the house the house mm -hmm. here yeah yeah uh, it's it's just right right there and for some reason they feel like, I guess, they feel like we're there and not in here because everything they're bringing up here, they're putting it on the steps of the, of the camper. Well, I'm sure they heard us sawing logs in there last night. <laughs> that was asleep. <laughs> but if they are moving through here, I welcome it. I want to sure. have them here and I want to be not afraid of them and respect them and get to a, a place where we can live in harmony. I mean, where I can go out in the woods and know they're there and not worry about it. So that's one of the reasons that we set up a gifting area. We <clears throat> we want to make them understand that we want we want to be friends. We don't want to be enemies. Right. And we don't feed down there. I've heard so many bad things about people that have habituated and and have started feeding them and then all of a sudden quit feeding them yeah. and then they they get real aggressive with them or, or things like that and but we leave brightly colored objects trinkets uh, the stuff Bigfoot doll the teddy bear just things that we feel like will attract their attention and gosh we've had several things going down there that there's just no explanation for um, there's no way that blue rock could have moved from that log down there to up here at the trailer nice. and there's nobody else around that knows that y'all are doing that they could be no. messing with you mm -mm. even if they did they can't get in here right. well not unless they walk a long ways through the woods but yeah. you know nobody nobody knows anything about what what we do or, or where we do it anything like that. there's just no explanation for it. it's like the skulls in the tree there's just you referred earlier to a mountain climbing line couldn't get up there and do that no, there's uh, why would he? <laughs> just there's no reason for it other than well what it's the way do. they're placed yeah you know, it's not random it's some kind of marker. It's whether it's, it's either for y'all or maybe it's something for them. I don't know. I think it's for them. I don't think it was for us because I just happened up on it, just yeah. wandering around in the woods and happened up on it. Uh, I believe it's some type of marker, either, uh, hey, this is a good hunting area. It's yeah. right beside a major game trail. Yeah. What What is your main focus here? I mean, you guys, you collect your evidence, you show it on your channel. I mean, we all have our reasons why we do this in one capacity or the other. What, uh, what, what would you like to see come out of what you guys do? I would love to be able to simply prove their existence. Uh, to get that video that there's no dispute in the evidence. This is a living, breathing Sasquatch. Uh, Pretty tall order. It is a tall order, and it's extremely difficult to do. You know, you've done, you've done research before out in the woods. It's it's so difficult. People don't understand how hard it is to get out there, try to get good, sharp, clear video of a animal that is extremely elusive. Uh, it's just it's it's ex extremely hard. Now we're going to take a look at just some of the evidence that they've collected over the years. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to show a bunch of it. You're going to need to go to their channel, check out 80 plus videos worth of evidence. But I mean, here's an obvious footprint. I mean, it's, it's just large. You can't tell what it is. Now, this little footprint here 
was captured right beside the shed at Robert Dotson's place. I had just pulled up and captured that. Now, this is an image that team member Scott Hunley had gotten on a nanny cam. And the picture on the left, same vantage point as the one on the right. The one on the left is the comparison picture. And you can see on the right there, there's something standing there filling that gap. It kind of looks female to me, almost like it has breasts, like you can see the arms in the front, maybe. But there's something is definitely there filling up that space. Now, this image, this kind of speaks to their elusiveness. This is the back side of this creature's head, and he's sitting in some laurel, looks like. And I believe this is in the same place on a different day. I'm not sure if it's the same creature, but I mean, that's a face. That is, that's not pareidolia. That has symmetry. I mean, you can see everything. That's a, that's a really good image. And from as far away as they said they were. I believe that. That's an excellent, excellent image. They're slick. I mean, even, even when they know that you know they're there and they're making the noises and move, they're just not going to come out for you to see them. It's no. just that, not that piece, I think, is hard for the non believers or even those who are skeptical sure. to understand how we can describe an 11 foot animal that can be an elusive and probably weighs seven, eight hundred pounds. Right. They're thinking an elephant moving through the forest, you're going to hear it. These animals aren't like that. No. And they've been doing this for long before you and I walked this earth. So they're pretty skilled at it. Yeah, most people that don't go in the woods feel like you should be able to just walk up on them and see them if they're there. Mm -hmm. If they're there, why aren't, why isn't everybody seeing it? You know, why are all the pictures fuzzy? And if CNN's not bringing it to you, it just doesn't exist, yeah. you know, in, in a lot of people's eyes. And I mean, that's what we're, we're trying to do. But see, I find that crazy sometimes because you can be in the woods and a cougar be on top of you and you not know it. Right. They're very still hunter. They, they well, it's just a lot of people that just don't go in the woods. They yeah. don't understand. They just don't understand that this thing is like a zoo. Mm -hmm. Just go out there and <laughs> see them. <laughs> yeah. They see you coming and they just get away. Yeah. They, they don't want you to see them. And now a few thoughts from author and seasoned field researcher, Christopher Noel. You know, hearing you guys talk about how skeptics and those who don't know anything about Sasquatch nature and behavior um, will say, you know, why are all the pictures blurry every time? Why can't you get an unobstructed video uh, shot of one of, these, one of these guys? It just reminds me, um, of the general blind spot that people have about Sasquatch. Um, kind of like the blind spot that Sasquatch almost always occupies in our own perception out in the field. Um, I heard that one of the Northwestern um, native tribes uh, call Sasquatch in their own language, it translates as the hide behind. Um, and that's just in their bones, uh, this, this mandate to constantly have something in between them and any potential observer. I remember when I was leading an expedition in upstate New York and a group of seven of us went into this uh, open field. Uh, it was about 10, 15 at night and no sooner had we gotten onto this field than we hear off to our left Woo! It was a beautiful moment. And we saw that it had come from a stand of trees that was dark. There was like a quarter moon out and the clouds were sometimes covering it. It was pretty dark, but you could see the stand of trees kind of looming uh, maybe 150 feet, 200 feet off to our left. And um, we just froze in our tracks and one of us had a thermal camera. So we looked over there and we scanned that clump of trees for the longest time, even as we heard wood knocks, um, you know, signals that confirmed what the whoop had been, or who the whoop had been from. And we, over the next hour and 15 minutes or so, we heard, heard more wood knocks. We talked to it, we tried to, you know, be neighborly and, um, we eventually heard huge uh, objects, whether they were stones or 
big tree limbs come boosh, into the water because there was a swamp water between between us. And even though he was that safe, with all this uh, barrier, this kind of castle moat situation that we look for, where the castle was this um, stand of trees and the moat was the swamp water, um, and even though it was uh, nighttime, he never once came out so that we could see him with our thermal cameras. And that just drove home to me the point that um, this concealment behavior is deep, deep-seated in them. Um, they, they hide even in the dark. And that's something that it's very hard to really grasp, uh, especially for skeptics who haven't had um, direct interactions. Um, or and or haven't followed the efforts and the frustrations of those of us who are trying to have experiences with and eyeballs on our next of kin, as I call them. One more thing I'll share is an analogy that, that occurred to me the other day. It would be as if um, somebody, and here I'm talking about like the, the skeptics or, or someone who doesn't believe that Sasquatch really are the way that they are. It would be as if one of them said, I, I really, I'm burning to study fish. I really, really want to learn more about fish. But what's the, what's the deal with all this water? It just, it gets in the way, you know? It's kind of the mindset. For us, I think it's, I think we need numbers. We need more people paying attention to the reality, the actuality, that these things are out there. And it's not a joke. As, as much disinformation as you find out there on this, and for whatever reason it's being put out, people hoax it when they don't have to. Just go out there and, and show what you're getting. Tell, you know, be honest about what you're getting. Mm -hmm. Or if you're speculating, tell people that's what you're doing. We, we run into that a lot. People bring out the facts. This there are no there are no experts <laughs> in in the world of Bigfoot. Not and these one. people that claim themselves as experts, trust me, there are no experts. Us researchers that go out there and try to do a good job and try to collect as much evidence as we can, you know, we learn every time we go in the woods we learn something. Sure. We learn something different every time we get out there. I agree with you that just because you're out there getting pictures and footprints, there's so much to learn that we yeah, don't know. There's only so much you can know. And for me, I mean, I want everything that y'all talked about, but just being out there is worth it. Yeah. <laughs> just having the experience of seeing big red through binoculars, that's all I needed out of it. Right. You know, it's beam me up, Scotty, that was, that was the one for me. And I'd love to see evidence like you're describing, but if we never get it, it's just beautiful being out there. Well, so you do get it. Would that be an end game for you guys? Or That'd, be you That'd be just the start. That'd be just the start. There's just so many questions out there that we're trying to get evidence to answer those questions. And the community of Bigfoot researchers that are out there doing the same thing, I think even if you've got that video that was undisputed, then that's just a start. I mean, you're, you're just starting down a journey. Now we know they're real. Now let's find out all these questions about all their different things that, that, that we wonder about and that we, we, we seek out there trying to find the answers to. Well, I think that's excellent. And that's, a, uh, that's something good to work toward. We, we certainly enjoy watching what you guys do when we get an opportunity to. Uh, one more thing, what, what's the future hold for the Swatch team? We're going to continue what we're doing. We're going to be out there as much as we possibly can, uh, trying to collect as much evidence uh, and put it on the channel for you guys. I mean, that's the reason that we have a channel is we want to share it with everybody. We're going to be out there as much as we possibly can. We're going to be spending a lot of time up here, uh, spending a lot of time over in Robert's research area. we got a team up there today that's up there doing research. And 
we're going to continue to collect that evidence and and put it out there on the channel for everybody else to see and and uh, i'm hopeful that that everybody enjoys what we're doing i'm hopeful that uh, uh, it's almost like what we're trying to do is include everybody just like they're there with us, just like they're along with us. And hopefully uh, the squatch team will be the one that gets that shot. Well, we certainly wish Bill and Sheila all the luck in the world on their odyssey. I want to thank them for taking the time to sit down with us, to tell us their story, show us some of their evidence. What a great couple and, and truly an asset to the Bigfoot community. Wow, what a great trip to Oklahoma. Uh, not our first. Uh, we actually shot episode six with D. Doss in south, southern Oklahoma. Uh, I mean, this was a little bit different area, but uh, Bill and Sheila Tucker, what do you think? I think they're wonderful people, very humble. They're, they're very down to earth. Um, welcomed us with open arms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were wonderful. So it was a it was a good trip, and it really was this time. I didn't feel so tired from this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't bad. Eight-hour drive, uh -uh. you know, one way, wasn't too bad. And we got another Oklahoma coming up. So it yeah. seems like Oklahoma has been a, a big area for us. Yeah, and actually, this exact same area we're going to be with uh, Miss D. Sims, Lady in the Woods. That'll be uh, the next episode <laughs> out. Um, we'll get that out. <clears throat> In Bigfoot Odyssey time, we're gonna get it out. Everything just went as planned, you know? We shot everything in one day. Uh, we were able to do everything linear. Uh, I talked to Bill for about a week and he was prepared. Yes. It's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, not that the others we didn't work with were prepared, but you know, a lot of people, and maybe it's just that people are actually starting to get what it is that we're doing. You know, if I, uh, you know, we were going to work, do a, our, our show with Rick Wells, Woodpecker Farm, and uh, his grandmother passed away, so we, you know, we had to cancel. And I had put the call out, if anyone knew anyone nearby we could do a show with. I'd already reached out to a couple of people, and Bill and Sheila were right there at the top of the list. And what I got back was a lot of, hey, there's a, there's a lot of Sasquatch in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's real boogery around here. We don't look for Bigfoot. That's not what we do. We make films. That's it. We make films either with the people that do look for Bigfoot or people that are having experiences around their house uh, ongoing. And uh, that that's the only videos we put out. Um, and it's, and it's mainly to show different areas. I mean, we have been to very rural areas, mm -hmm. and Sheila's and Bill's was not easy to find. No. Um, and we've been in the middle of town, like with Rachel and Carl. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we've been around people's homes, and we've been had to go out to see. So it's, it's in different areas, and I think that's something that we like showing you, that this can occur anywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just something we've kind of learned along the way, is that it it's occurring all over and uh, you know it's part of <clears throat> I always ask you know people on our live show or especially this last one about the Bigfoot population and how many they think there are in the United States a lot of the experts come out with some what I think are low numbers I think they have to be on up there in numbers just as a, a breeding population with no apparent predator other than us, I suppose. So. Well, and, and like like we've said, we've been in different areas and they've, they've got two, three, ten different ones on tape. Yeah. And if they're family units, you right. know, it's, the numbers are going to add up, so. I think so. But. Just, I don't know, so much we don't know yet. That's all. <clears throat> but um, I had actually made a comment a while back on one of the, one of our live feeds about there not being very much of a community, a Bigfoot community. And uh, not really what I meant, 
And the more I thought about it, I had actually reached out to a lot of the community and, uh, and they responded. And you're gonna get to see that, uh, that very soon. Um, we had the, uh, the little fundraiser we had for North Carolina Sasquatch Watchers to, to get them a new camera. A lot of people responded. Uh, we we want to thank everybody that participated in that. Um, we're going to give you a proper recognition and uh, thank you. People stick around for the end of this video. We're going to have a song that was written for us and uh, we're going to give credit to those that, that helped out with that. Everyone that's, that's donated for, uh, for the cameras since we started doing it is, uh, is going to get recognized here. So stick around for that and uh, something special right after this mm -hmm. that I think is special. Anyway, it's special to me. It was, uh, it's a sense of community that, uh, that I didn't, wasn't expecting and uh, pretty proud of it. Well, and that's something we have said from the beginning that if people work together, you can usually reach that common goal a lot easier than tearing each other apart. So, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> well, if there's nothing else, no, yeah, we had a wonderful trip. I want to thank Bill and Sheila for all their hospitality, it was wonderful. Yeah. Had a great time. I enjoyed being out in the woods a little bit, I was good. Couldn't get in much trouble on this one, so. Put the camera in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> I will be getting uh, in trouble next week, y'all, so I gave him a break this week. <laughs> but no, it was a nice trip. It was. it was a very nice trip. So, for Bill and Sheila Tucker, the Bigfoot Odyssey crew, Stout Owens, Alan Yankel Lunas, my beautiful wife, Linda, I'm Kerry Arnold. We we'll hope to see y'all in the next Bigfoot Odyssey. Good night, y'all. Hi, this is Robert from the Tri Ever Paranormal YouTube channel. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hey, everyone. This is Tracy Arnold with Hiking with Sasquatch Outlaw YouTube channel. Thank you for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Thank you for giving a thumbs up. And if you haven't, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and click the bell icon. I'm Richard Borchardt. Thank you for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Why don't you like and subscribe, and you can get more of this. Boots on the ground. Hey, Bigfoot Tony here. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin here from Kevin Lang's Flagland. Thanks for watching this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Hey, what's up, guys? Hiking Dave here. Thank you so much for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And you don't have to smash that like button. Just give it a little tap. Hey, this is Bigfoot Explorer. This is Christy Sci-Fi. Thanks so much for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Please like, share, and subscribe. Hey, guys, this is Darren from Sasquatch Truth. You're watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Like and subscribe. Hi, it's Larry from the YouTube channel Pipecat. Thank you for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hey everybody, this is Carl Gotro. You're watching Bigfoot Aussie. Please like, share, and subscribe. Good evening. You are watching Bigfoot Odyssey. If you like what you see, please subscribe, hit that like button, and stay safe in the woods. Hey guys, this is Daniel Benoit, founder of the ECBRO. I want to thank you guys for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to subscribe and click that little bell icon. This is Adidas with the BDRP. Thank you for watching Carrie and Linda on this edition of Bigfoot Odyssey. Make sure you hit subscribe, click the bell so you can get notifications. Hey guys, it's Rick from Webbooger Farm. You're watching Bigfoot Odyssey with me, Linda and Carrie. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, tell a friend. Happy boogering. Hey folks, Chris Noel here. The first time I caught one minute of Bigfoot Odyssey, my whole day was shot. I binged for seven hours. But you're watching, so you know what I mean. Hey, what's up? I'm Taylor from Tate and Taylor NCSW, and you're watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and even hit the little bell notification to get live updates as soon as they post their videos. How awesome is that? We approve this YouTube channel, and so should you. Hey, everybody. Mark from Colorado Bigfoot. You are watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, hit that bell button, the notification button, or even just check in on your own once in a while and find... 
those structures. Hi, this is Brock from Bigfoot and Beyond. Thank you for watching Bigfoot Odyssey. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Well, there's things there in the night Would make a grown man die from fright So many things, it's all so clear Something just ain't right When it's too hard to ignore you gotta open up that door And take some time to try and find The truth that lies in store In your big foot odyssey In your big foot odyssey Forget everything you ever known Open up your mind and see It's your big foot odyssey And you can choose not to but the truth is out there waiting and it's up to you to see